Welcome to Everybody Church. I just want to tell you, we are so excited about what we have seen happening over the last three weeks. It seems like people are sharing uh, the messages, and more than that, they are connecting uh, with people. And even though they're not maybe geographically close by, people are making friendships through the magic of Everybody Church, and we're very excited about that. Stan's got a great talk in store for us today, but before he has his talk, Rachel's going to sing a beautiful song. You're going to love it. All the poor and powerless, and all the lost and lonely, all the thieves will come confess.
Hey, everybody, church, um, it's good to be with you again. People ask me all the time, they say, what is your, I mean, this, I guess this is a typical question for a preacher, what's your favorite Bible verse, or what's your favorite biblical text? And I probably would answer that different ways uh, over different, in, in different periods of my life. But honestly, consistently, over and over again through the years, if somebody asked me what's my favorite book in the Bible, I would have to say it's 2 Corinthians. I don't know how many people say 2 Corinthians, and I'm not trying to be different by saying 2 Corinthians, but I want to explain to you why I love 2 Corinthians so much. And uh, there are a few chapters, like chapter 1, chapter 4, and chapter 12, that especially stand out to me. And I'm going to spend some time in those chapters, really especially chapter 12 today. But let me tell you why and read through a few verses here for the next 15 to 20 minutes and just give you a sense of why this text means so much to me. All right, a little bit of a background. 2 Corinthians, I like to call the spiritual travel diary, um, the spiritual travel diary of the Apostle Paul. 2 Corinthians is the most intimate connection that we will ever have with this incredible man who has influenced the world and especially the Christian church so profoundly. 2 Corinthians is the chapter for the Apostle Paul kind of pulls back the curtain and says, I want to let you behind the scenes and I want you to see who I am, my heart, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the stuff on my resume that I'm proud of, the stuff on my resume that you know, I'm, I'm not so proud of. I, I want you to see my faith, but I also, I also want you to see my fear. Now, the reason Paul does that, I think, is substantial. Um, in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is actually defending his place in the Corinthian church's life. He is a literary pastor to a lot of places. I mean, the church is just in its infancy, and so leaders aren't established and there aren't a bunch of you know, schools putting out ministers who are going to these places. So Paul literally is this apostle who's planting churches and then moving on and yet staying in contact literarily through the mail with these churches and trying to provide oversight and care and insight to them. And, and in the Corinthian church, there were some interlopers who were trying to kind of usurp Paul's place and put him out and position themselves as the ultimate leaders there. Um, I don't think Paul was clutching and grabbing for power, but I think he truly didn't trust these people, that their hearts were in the right place, and he still fancied himself, and I, I think rightly, he believed himself to be their leader. Second Corinthians is his appeal to the Corinthian church, his effort to credibilize himself, and even more to reestablish himself as kind of their spiritual leader, their spiritual director, their, their parent in the Lord. So he starts 2 Corinthians in the first chapter by saying, okay, here comes my defense. This is why you should still, me, still allow me this place of pastoral leadership in your life. He says, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be ignorant or unaware of the trouble which came to me when I was in Asia. There was a time in my travels, Paul said, when I was, and I love this language, he says, when I was pressed above measure and beyond my strength to bear some things. I mean, that old idea that God will never put more on you than you can bear, and we could argue that either way, but Paul said it was tested in my life. Without giving a clear description of what that moment was and all the details, Paul said, I just want you to get the net effect was, I was pressed beyond measure. I, it was beyond what I could take. And, and, and some of you have been there. Some of you honestly are there right now. I was pressed beyond measure above the realm of my strength. In other words, above my capacity to deal with it. Paul said it was this thing that I was going through, whether it was a physical illness, you know, a, a psychological malady, a, a relational situation, we don't know. Maybe it was a combination. Sometimes it's not so clean, you know, that one thing can put us in this place. A lot of time it's an algorithm, a, you know, a lot of things. Paul said, but what I want you to know 
is that in that moment when I was beyond myself, he said, I literally despaired of life. That's a powerful little phrase. Paul said, it was so bad that I despaired of life. I can't remember who it was, but gosh, it's been a quarter of a century ago. I was studying this passage, and I read a commentary, and something the commentator said really took me. He said, that phrase, despaired of life, does not mean Paul was saying, things got so bad I thought I was going to die. Paul said, or the commentator said, no, Paul was saying in that phrase, things got really, really bad, and I thought I was going to die. And then life ratcheted up, and things got so much worse, I was afraid that I wouldn't. Things got so bad, I thought I was going to die, and then things got worse, and I was afraid that I wouldn't. Paul said, I was pressed beyond measure above my strength, so much so that I despaired of life. And, and I just, I want to say for those that are, are, are contemplating, you know, whether or not you can make it or whether you have strength to bear, this text is for you. Second Corinthians really is for you. Paul knows what it means to stand on the precipice, that liminal space between this world and the next, and literally long for the relief of leaving this world. I think I would say, and I don't want to pass judgment on anyone because I, I've, I've taken to where I don't say anymore someone committed suicide. I, I feel more comfortable saying somebody lost their life to suicide. Um, Paul was there. And he explains in the fourth chapter later, and I'll come to that, that he really did want to die. Paul said, but to you, I want you to know it's amazing to me that in his defense, he doesn't start out by saying, here are the miracles I've done, here are the books I've written, this is who I am, this is the, the supernal, supernatural experiences I've had. I mean, Paul has a long, great pedigree, but instead of starting there in his defense, he starts with this very raw and real human experience. And I think essentially he's saying, and, and so much of this was because of my love for you. And he does say that. He says, I was pressed above measure, above my strength, so much so that I despaired of life. And these things happened to me that I might learn to stop trusting in myself and start trusting in God who raises the dead. And then this incredible phrase, he says, and if I was afflicted, I mean, this is right at the beginning of this defense letter, and if I was afflicted, which I have been, he said, but if I was afflicted, it was for your sake. Well, how was it for our sake? Well, I mean, on the surface, it's pretty clear. I was afflicted on the road to get to you to establish a church. I was persecuted for starting that church. I've been persecuted in this Roman Empire for being an, you know, a leader of an aberrant religion. Well, that's clear, but it's deeper than that. He says... My affliction wasn't just for you on that superficial level of obviously I've been persecuted for doing what I do. No, it's deeper than that, he said. If I was afflicted, it was for your sake. For, here's the reason. For when I was afflicted, I was driven in my affliction to God for comfort. And so when I was greatly afflicted, I was greatly comforted. I look back now reflectively and that wound, that affliction that I thought was going to destroy me, in many ways it tried to, and in many ways maybe it did. Maybe there are parts of me that are gone. Maybe there are parts of me that will never come back. It happens. That's part of the grief process is letting go. Paul said, but if I was greatly afflicted, it was for your sake because in my great affliction, those things that I, I, I thought were like IVs that were going to open me to a dimension of pain and ultimately bitterness and sadness and sorrow and loss that I, at times I felt was going to destroy me, Paul said, eventually, through a process of time and maturity, I began to realize that not only was this not an IV opening me to bitterness and loss and the end, this was not something that was terminal. Paul said, this affliction was a funnel 
that opened me to a dimension of grace and sympathy, empathy. It opened me to a dimension of grace that I would have never known without the affliction. I do tons of work in the LGBTQ community, and these are a group of people who have been so deeply afflicted. Um, sadly, much of the affliction has come at the hand of the church, of religion, of the synagogue, of the temple, of the mosque. The very thing that should have been a comfort to them has been a pain to them. And, and there are a lot of people I mean, listening even now, and if this is where you are, no judgment. Be where you are. Just, if you have the capacity to leave the door of your heart cracked ajar to what I'm about to say, please do. And if you can't, it's okay. Paul said, I was afflicted, and the affliction opened me to a dimension of comfort. And what I know about the LGBTQ community, whatever I have given to them, and this is not cliche, whatever I have given to them and this work as a cisgender heterosexual ally has been returned to me, as Jesus said, a hundredfold. I don't know that I've lost too much, but if I have lost anything, it pales in comparison to what I found. But within that community, there are a lot of people who are still at the place that this affliction that is inflicted upon them, it is embittering. It still steeps them in resentment. Um, they are indeed victims of something that they don't deserve. And there are some that are still, because of that, jaded and cynical and have a hard edge toward all things spiritual and religious and especially Christian. But there are others, and this is the greater lot, that have moved beyond that resentment. And over the last three or four years working in the realm of inclusion, I, I've got to say I'm really not in awe of the Christian church as it opens its arms to include the LGBTQ community. That, I'm not in awe of that at all. We should have done that a long time ago. We should never needed to be where we are, you know, pressing inclusion. The inclusion that I think is most remarkable is that you're still here. That in those years when I was not an affirming pastor, you still sat in our pews and you still let me pastor you. You, you drank from a separate but equal water fountain. Some would say you shouldn't have done that. Some would say that's Stockholm Syndrome. That's uh, the abused subjecting themselves to more abuse, and maybe that's true. I don't know. I'm not wanting to argue that point. But I have been deeply moved and changed, not so much because I've become an inclusive pastor, but upon retrospect that I was always included by you, that you were still here. Um, you still, I mean, you still included us. And what I know about the LGBTQ community while well, some are still hurting and resentful and bitter, and I get it, there are so many more of you who are the most empathic, empathetic, caring, loving people, the most inclusive, take up for the underdog, fight for the marginalized people that I've ever met, and of course you are, because you know what it means. And you have taken what it meant for you. You have taken that pain and you've done exactly what Jesus did. You have redeemed that wound. Because there's a way to handle the affliction. There's, there's a way to handle the hurt. And that is to build thick walls around your heart and to go into self-protective mode and to become jaded and cynical and say, I'm never trusting again. And then there is this thing, this rubric, this method of soul, this MO that Paul referred to. And that is, when I was afflicted, instead of getting bitter, and as Emily Dickinson said, the wound grew so large until my whole life fell in it, instead of getting bitter and falling into that wound, you allowed it to open you like a funnel to a dimension of grace. You have allowed it to soften your hearts until you are 
an incredibly giving, merciful, gracious people. And Paul looked at the church at Corinth and said, if I was afflicted, it was for your sake, because when I was afflicted, I was driven to God for a comfort that only God could satisfy. And when I was filled up through that funnel of my own pain, when I was filled up with that dimension of divine grace that I would have never known otherwise unless I needed it, here's the rubric. Paul said, so when I was afflicted, I was greatly comforted, and I want to explain my ministry to you. I now comfort others with the comfort I was comforted with. To employ a phrase that I heard from the mouth of Frederick Buechner years ago, one of my favorite authors, ultimately we are called to be stewards of our pain. We follow one who has chosen to heal the world not by his resurrection alone. But Isaiah 53 said he doesn't heal us through his grand power, you know, through celestial light shows of supernal display. Isaiah said he heals us by his wounds we are healed the apostle paul is following the one he calls lord here the one who took his deepest wounds and redeemed them henry nowen said until he himself became a wounded healer not just a wounded healer but one who healed. I mean, a wounded healer doesn't just mean the guy who's doing the healing has wounds too. No, it's more than that. It means the guy who's doing the healing is healing others through the medium of his own wounds. We are followers of one who doesn't fall into the wound, but redeems the wound and uses it for the good of others. We have taken our sorrows and not dismissed them, but entrusted them into the hands that are divine, that make all things work together. Not just the good, not just the bad, but the good and the bad come together. And they are so inextricably linked that they work in us a good thing. And we become stewards of our pain. We become stewards of our comfort. And the comfort we give others is divine comfort. It's comfort that we ourselves have been comforted by. So the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, and I'll come back and do the 12th chapter another time. This is enough. He does exactly what Jesus does with Thomas. When the guy we call Doubting Thomas, who was not a doubter at all, or at least not unjustifiably so, when Thomas was not there on that first Sunday evening when the resurrected Lord met his disciples, the disciples, they, they tried to transfer their experience to Thomas, and Thomas was respectful. He's like, guys, I appreciate that you have your experience, and, and I can live vicariously to some extent through other people's experiences, but there are some experiences like the resurrected Lord I, I can't do that vicariously. I need my own deal. And the next week, Jesus walked through the walls, metaphysically walked through the walls where his disciples were holed up in a room, scared to death, and there was Thomas. And Thomas didn't say, I want to see you float. I want to see you glow. I want to see you walk out of a tomb. I want to see you pull a rabbit out of the hat. You know, turn water into wine, multiply breads and fishes, do one of your miracles. That's the stuff on the resume Thomas said, I don't want to see. Thomas said, would you just show me the wounds in your hand and the print in your side? And Jesus pulled back the robe, extended his hand, and when Thomas saw not perfection and, you know, clean, smooth, six-pack of God. No, when he saw the wounds, not infected, not gangrenous, 
but wounds that have been tended to by the divine antibodies of grace and mercy and love and perspective. He didn't see wounds that were infected, but he also didn't see wounds that were completely healed. They were in the process of healing. Thomas saw the still healing wounds of Jesus. And Thomas said, my Lord, and for the first time, somebody said it, Thomas said, my God. So everybody church is a place where we heal one another by our wounds. Everybody church is a place where we appreciate all the great stuff on the resume and all the fun stuff and all the glory. I mean, I'm all, all, I'm all for, I'm all in on walking on water and miracles and all that side of things. But we are a group of people who are tending to our wounds lovingly in community. And we refuse to act like they're completely healed. We just, we're not gonna pretend here. We're not gonna act like it's all okay. We have the ability here to pull back the robe and show the redness and the tenderness still exist. But we also are not gonna be a community that allows those things to turn us bitter and jaded and we're going to flip off the rest of the religious world. We're just not going to do that. We are not going to hate the haters and exclude the excluders. We're just not going to do it. We follow one that heals through wounds. And we believe that even the worst thing that's ever happened to us can be redeemed in some divine alchemy to become glorious beauty. And that is what's happening at everybody church bring your wounds pull back the robe and let's tend well to one another's pain until it becomes healing for this world that is a sufficient prayer and on that i simply say in christ's name amen look forward to seeing you again be well this week wow every every time every time i hear him do a bible story like that um that's that's very encouraging and very beautiful I want to take just a moment and thank you, those of you who've been with us from the very beginning, for watching. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for telling your friends about Everybody Church. And then some of you have been very generous in helping us financially. And I just want to say it means a lot. Everybody Church is not about the teachers. Everybody Church is about you. And it really is for everybody. Have a great week. Everybody Church is a 501c3 nonprofit that uses the tools of social media and digital innovation to connect progressively minded people around the world to change our world. Regardless of differences, we envision a world marked by equality, sustainability, justice, and love. Our work is made possible by tithes and offerings and charitable giving from members of our community. Everybodychurch.com slash give.